be here. I'm glad that you included me over at Claire on the other side of the world. This is amazing. It's 10 p.m. here, <laughs> but um, I'm based in Denver. Um, I am a developer advocate for JFrog, have been for a couple years. And uh, prior to that, uh, I was in development all the way from an intern to a um, principal engineer, so a little over 20 years of experience. And my primary language has been Java, although you know, in the beginning I started in C++ and my first project I think was Ruby on Rails that I worked on, so lots of different things over time. But um, Java is definitely um, the closest, the language to me. This is a talk I've given a few times. I really enjoy giving it. It, it was um, something that I did. I, I did a lot of research. Um, this isn't something, uh, it, it's a little bit different. And just to set these expectations up front, there, there is a lot of information in here about Docker, of course, but this is not a tutorial or a deep dive on Docker commands or anything like that. Um, there's a little bit of that in here, but there's a ton of documentation out there already. So I don't want to you know, repeat what you can find easily on your own. So when I put this talk together, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do some background research and focus a little bit more on how we got here and get some answers to these why questions of why we're using containers so much today, why we're doing any of this. And my hope is that you'll come away with a better understanding of the history behind containers. That was my favorite part and how they actually work on your system and some of what's going on under the covers, especially from a developer perspective when you're developing on your own machine. And there's a lot of there's a lot of intro information here, but there's a lot of details that I see get passed over time and time again. When I look at Docker files that teams give me to, to take a look at, I find um, some things in there that are gotchas. Um, and we'll go over some of those a little bit later in the talk. All right, that said, I'm excited to share with you uh, things that I learned about containers. Okay, so uh, first we'll be going over a brief history. And then an interesting part is the container market. And there's a particular report that I'll bring up and, and show you uh, that has some interesting stats in it for the last few years. Then we'll talk about what Docker actually is, uh, get a good definition of that, and what is a container, how, how that actually looks on your system. And then we'll go over some container and image gotchas that you will find, especially if you're new con to containers, you'll run into these pretty quickly. How are you using containers today? I'd be curious to find out from you and feel free to drop it in the chat how you're using containers. Uh, are you using them just on your local system? Um, there are other scenarios too, right? You could be using them just for test systems. Um, and then of course there's production, but I guess just remember that if you're not using in, in production, there's definitely use case scenarios to use them elsewhere as well. Okay, we have a few people chiming in locally, test and QA and production. So all the way through, awesome, okay. All right, do remember that um, these, you know, being able to use containers in your uh, development environments is super important. Being able to use them in your test environments as well um, can really be helpful. Okay, let's go ahead and start, jump right in, learn about containers. Um, I, like I said, I've given this talk a few times and um, I will never give another talk again that has any pictures of, of shipping containers on them. So hopefully you'll enjoy the banana theme. I've got lots of banana pictures to enjoy through this, this talk. Um, and there's actually a, a couple of reasons why I chose bananas to begin with. When I initially was putting this talk together, I started thinking about something that my grandfather always told me. And this was around Christmas time. He, um, when he was young, he and his siblings would get a banana and for Christmas. That was the one time in the year that they got bananas. And uh, this was a treat for them. This was in the twenties and thirties. So uh, times are pretty hard for them during that period. And his brothers and sisters would take a fork and they would scrape the banana peel to get every last bit of banana off so that they can enjoy it fully. And this just kind of had the analogy for me of, um, you know, being uh, short on resources, right? Lim dealing with limited resources. And 
it, it's kind of, you know, um, kind of like how computer resources were in the 1960s and 70s, right? They were very limited and very expensive. And on top of that, it took forever to get anything done. Often a computer would be dedicated for a long period of time to a single task for a single user. And obviously the limits on time and resources here created bottlenecks and inefficiency as expected. And just being able to share a machine was not enough. There needed to be a method to share without getting in each other's way or having one person inadvertently cause the system to crash for everyone. And this uh, brought about a need for better strategies in sharing compute resources. And this started a path of innovation that we see massive benefits from today. There are some key points that brought us to the state we are in today with containers. And I'm gonna start our history lesson with Chirut. Chirut was born in 1979 during the development of the seventh edition of Unix. And it was added to, the BS to BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution in 1982. And being able to change the apparent root directory for a process and its children, which Chirut allows you to do or change root, uh, that results in a bit of isolation in order to provide an environment for testing a different distribution, for example. In fact, that's how this utility initially made it in to, um, into the source control was for that intent to be able to test in, in um, some isolation. That was a great idea, it was great. It solved some specific problems, but more was needed. And this is when the jail command came about. It was introduced in 2000 uh, by FreeBSD. Uh, jail is a little bit more sophisticated than Chirut and its additional features help further isolate file systems, users and networks. Uh, and it includes the ability to assign an IP address to each jail. Now, not all of that happened in 2000. Those improvements happened over a period of time, but it's an important utility to learn about. Uh, 2004 Solaris Zones brought us ahead further uh, by giving us an application full user process and file system space and access to system hardware. And Solaris Zones also helped us to get familiar with this concept of being able to uh, snapshot a file system. And when you work with images, uh, you learn pretty quickly that that concept is important. In 2006, Google jumped in with their process containers. These were later renamed C groups. You probably are familiar with that term. And C groups center around isolating and limiting the resource usage of a process. Moving right along in 2008, C groups were merged into the Linux kernel, which along with Linux namespaces led to IBM's development of Linux containers. And now it gets interesting. In 2013, uh, this was a big year. Docker came on the scene and they brought their ability to package containers and move them from one environment to another. And that same year, Google open sourced their Let Me Container That For You project, which provided applications the ability to create and manage their own subcontainers. And it's from here that we saw the use of containers, especially Docker containers, explode. In 2014, Docker chose to swap out their use of the LXC toolset for launching containers with libcontainer in order, that's another project, in order to utilize a native Golang solution. And that was when I very first got involved with Docker, I didn't realize that it was written in Go. So that was an interesting bit of trivia to learn. Um, also libcontainer, um, Google and Docker decided to kind of join forces there. So their Let Me Container That For You project kind of merged into libcontainer and they decided to move forward with that project. Right, I'm almost done with this history lesson. I know this is a lot, but hold on to your seats. I'm gonna skip over um, some details around different projects and organizations and specs that came out just because I wanna to get to an important date, June, 2015. This is when the Open Container Project Initiative was established. And this is gonna help you get some insight into some of the activity and motivations behind ships in the market and why that started to happen. Um, the 
this organization, the OCI, is an organization under the Linux Foundation. It includes members from many major stakeholders, including Docker, and it has the goal of creating open standards for container runtimes and image specification. Now, when this was announced, there were like 20 organizations involved, big, big organizations involved in this um, this effort to come up with you know common ground around containers and um while this was happening while they were developing these specs there's a couple of other dates that are important to java devs specifically in 2011 um in july actually java 7 was released and then work was started on Java 8, which was released in March of 2014. Now keep these dates in mind as well, because when you start containerizing your Java applications, this little bit of history is important to know. I'll bring it up again later, um, but that's it for now. Just keep in mind there were some you know, interleaved efforts of um, container image and Docker development and also Java development. All right, let's take a look at what was going on in the market. This was pretty interesting to me. I did a little hunting. I found that for the last several years, Sysdig, which is a company that provides a really powerful monitoring and troubleshooting tool for Linux, has put out a container usage report based on the analysis of their users. And part of that report includes data on container runtimes that are in use. And this report, um, I'm going to start back in 2017, it gets better and better every year, the data that they come out with. And um, it's, it's been pretty interesting. But just starting out in 2017, they analyzed data from 45,000 containers. There's no graph available uh, because 99% of those containers were Docker. So they didn't split up you know, the um, run times or anything in that case. But in 2018, they analyzed double the amount, 90,000 containers, double the sample size. And here we start getting some division on, in Docker and other runtimes. And in this case, we have 83% Docker and 12% CoreOS rocket containers, 4% Mesos containers, and 1% LXE. So it looks like other container runtimes are starting to encroach a little bit on the use of Docker. In 2019, I found another Sysdig container usage report. This included stats from over 2 million containers. So now we're talking some real data. Uh, 45,000 to begin with was just not that much, but um, 2 million, we're starting to, to get some real, real data here. Docker is still holding strong. 79% uh, were using the Docker runtime. But now we have 18% is container D. And it's also, uh, it's worth, Noting here, container D is actually a runtime that Docker builds on top of now. I'll discuss that a little bit more later. And then the last 4% is cryo, uh, another runtime that um, is an option to use. This data is pretty interesting because of what's been happening over the last few years. Something to note here, especially, is the disappearance of the rocket containers. And that's kind of a sad story. Um, CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat at the beginning of 2018. And prior to that, Rocket was accepted to the CNCF. That's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. It was an incubating project there, and it looked like a really promising competitor to Docker's Container D. However, since that CoreOS acquisition, the development of the project went dormant. And in mid-2019, Rocket was archived by the CNCF. And in February 2020, that project was ended. Now, the repo is still there. It's not like you can't use Rocket containers if you wanted to, but just be aware that no one is maintaining that project now. And I see a, a question in the chat. How is Container D different from the Docker runtime? And um, that has to do with, um, I don't know if you've heard, um, you know, Kubernetes um, is um, uh, no longer using the Docker runtime. And that has to do with a, you know, the utilities that are used, um, the level of abstraction that there is in order to run different runtimes. Docker is a uh, entire tech stack and the container runtime is just part 
of that tech stack. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail in some future slides. So uh, please let me know if I don't answer your question in a bit about Container D a little more specifically. All right, um, the next report that I found was put out in uh, January of 21. 2021, so has to do with 2020 data. And this is, again is 2 million containers. They do um, have a qualifier that, that says a subset of, of customer containers. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but this report includes a ton of detailed information about their demographics and data sources, as well as other interesting information about what services customers are running, as well as what they're using for orchestration like Kubernetes. And in a nutshell, what I got from this report was this. Uh, notice the increase in the usage of container D from 18% in the previous report to now 33%. And it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues, especially since what I, I just talked about, um, Kubernetes uh, is deprecating support for Docker as a runtime. And um, now that I've, you know, I've introduced some of these other container runtimes, um, that exist out there, uh, we're getting close to talking about what exactly Docker provides you and what the differences are with the run times. This report just came out. Um, this is the 2022 report that Sysdig put out there, and it's not a whole lot different. We see a little bit of decrease in Docker and an increase in container D. And obviously that would be because, um, you know, especially if your orchestration is Kubernetes, it no longer supports the Docker runtime. It now supports uh, Container D uh, by default. All right, so what exactly is Docker? And um, what Docker has over other players in the container game is a focus on commoditizing a complete solution that makes it easy for developers to package and deploy their applications. And once once containers became easy to use, we all witnessed that explosion of tools and resources around containers. And the Docker image format um, is now the de facto standard in the market. The stats I showed from Sysdig are specific to container runtimes. There's that word again. Uh, that terminology is important um, to understand here. And I'll explain some of those pieces and parts in working with containers and you'll understand why Docker was able to grab so much of this market. Uh, more questions about uh, what is the reason K8 is deprecating Docker? It has to do with that abstraction layer in there. Um, the, the kubelet uses something called the CRI. And um, the CRI is an abstraction layer that hooks into a container runtime. Docker was more than what you needed. You just needed the wrong time, but Docker includes more than that. Uh, they've, been, um, they've been working on breaking up their tech stack into different pieces and they actually contributed container D, which is a high level runtime. Um, and, and then they refactored their stuff so that now Docker itself uses container D as well. So if you're on later versions of, of Docker, um, you wouldn't even notice that difference. Okay, what do we actually need? Or, oh, and I didn't really get to the reason. The reason to do that was uh, um, Kubernetes really wanted to be able to support running other runtimes besides Docker, besides Container D, and having that abstraction layer of, of the CRI um, that allows them to do that. And um, and then they don't have to maintain this complete other path that they had to do with Docker. That was kind of a special scenario that now they can get rid of that. And now they have this single abstract layer that where they can use other container runtimes as well. Okay, what do we actually need to get our apps out there and running with containers? And um, this is a list of, of needs that are broken up into discrete features. This kind of helps explain the pieces and parts of Docker. Um, first and foremost, we need that container itself. Some of you might be asking about virtual machines at this point. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this session. But the one thing I will say about virtual machines is that they are not the same thing as a container. The biggest difference being that a VM includes an entire OS all to itself and containers share the systems OS. 
The point of the container is to be lightweight and have the ability to move from one environment to another seamlessly and quickly. Um, so, you know, having the bulk of a VM makes that a little bit clumsy. Um, there are developments happening in the VM space, uh, definitely worth looking into, but that's a topic for another talk. Um, so the rest of this, these, this discrete functionality that we're looking for with containers, uh, we need an image format to define a container. And then we need a way to build an image of a container. And just to be clear, an image is basically a blueprint that um, a container can be launched from. You could have many containers that are launched from the same image. Um, in a Java you know, analogy, you could say that the, doc, the image, the container image is a class, and then the containers are objects of that class or instances of that class. All right, um, we need a way to manage um, images. We need a way to distribute and share those images with each other. And then we need a way to create, launch, and run a container environment. And then we need a way to manage the life cycle of container images. And I didn't even get into orchestration or anything, but this is plenty to prove my point about Docker and how they put all of this together in a single package, easy for developers to consume and use. Okay, Docker, the whole package. In the context of those developer needs that we just went through, Docker was ready with an answer for all of them. If you want to start using containers, they had Docker Engine. Um, if you want to, or if you need an image format, they provided the Docker image format. If you need a way to build an image, use a Docker file and call Docker build. And if you need to manage images, there's a command you can run, Docker images um, and Docker remove. Uh, if you want to share your images or use an image from someone else, you can call Docker push and Docker pull. And there's Docker Hub, where you can store and share all of these images. Then you need a way to launch, run, and manage your containers and their lifecycle. So you can call Docker Run, Docker Stop, or Docker PS. Uh, Docker succeeded in quickly meeting those needs of a container-hungry market. Uh, on top of that, the tool sets that Docker provided made it all easy. And this is a huge plus for developers. I don't know if, if any of you have looked at Docker desktop lately, but it's pretty nice. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty good tool. Remember in our history lesson, when I spoke about the open container initiative, out of all of those features that we just discussed that Docker offers, there were two of them that were taken up right away uh, by the OCI, and that was the image format and the container runtime. Docker did quite a bit of reorganizing their code base. They developed abs abstractions. Um, they pulled out discrete functionality like container D, and they are a heavy contributor to the OCI. They gave the Docker v2 image spec as a basis for the OCI image spec, and then they provided uh, run C, which is a low level container runtime that was contributed as a reference implementation to the um, of the OCI container runtime spec. And there's a, quite a few, you know, there's other container runtimes out there, in, including container D, cryo, um, all with various features and specific use cases. But earlier, um, I mentioned that Docker actually built on top of container D. Container D was actually contributed by Docker to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And it internally runs Run C. Uh, Container D was integrated into Docker and has been in use since version 1.11. And that came out clear back in 2016. So it's been a while now. Um, so using Container D is where you should be at, at this time. And the next few years is gonna be interesting to observe what happens with these specs and how the OCI moves forward from here. There's quite a range of differing opinions about what should and should not be in the standard for a container runtime. And we're in a situation right now where having a runtime that just meets the requirements of the spec doesn't seem to be enough to drive adoption, which is why we don't see a lot more use of like cryo, for example.
um, Kubernetes is making it you know, easier to use different runtimes, but it's still difficult uh, to do that through the entire, um, you know, from development all the way to production. And I had a question in the chat, do all container runtimes use run C? Pretty much internally, <laughs> um, most of them do. Um, you know, there's, there's a few out there, but it's interesting how um, Docker's, um, their examples, their implementation of the specs, it's like they're the only ones putting forth implementations or, you know, so there might be something going on there. I don't know if it's political or what, but it does seem like we've pretty much settled on run C and container D, but I think that even cryo uses run C, um, as a, you know, internally low level. And, and what is run C? I should have pulled up these links for you. Um, these are different, different projects out there. Um, run C is considered a low level uh, runtime and uh, container D is a high level runtime. And it just has to do with um, what functions, uh, what features it has that are available. Um, I've added a couple links here on this slide. Um, and they, and I, you can pull them off the slide when I share the slides, but, um, these are really excellent starting places to learn more about container runtimes. If you're curious about those details, the second one here is the beginning of a blog series by Ian Lewis. He's a, a Google dev advocate. And the first subtitle in that blog is literally why are container runtimes so confusing? <laughs> so it's a really good place to start. Uh, he's really good about uh, succinct, succinctly explaining in some of those details. And he goes into low level and high level runtimes and where they possibly overlap. And, you know, what if you don't want to use Docker? Uh, there are other options out there for you to build your images. Now, even though Kubernetes has deprecated, you know, the Docker runtime, it doesn't mean that you can't use Docker images there. You absolutely can. Those images follow the same spec. They can be run by container D and launched by container D. So a developer can continue to use Docker on their machine. Um, your build system could use Docker. Um, and then, you know, those images can be used um, by your Kubernetes clusters. So um, first of all, sit down, sit yourself down and ask, why do I not want to use Docker? Um, maybe you don't want to use the long running Docker daemon. You know, that's, that's one, one reason. Docker running on hosts, there's a, a daemon that um, is long running, you know, maybe whatever your circumstances are, you, maybe you don't want to do that. Um, maybe you just want to stop thinking that Docker is all there is. Uh, I tend to go for the underdog sometimes and just want to try something different. And this is one reason why we should stop calling all containers Docker containers, because they aren't necessarily. There are different types of containers. Or maybe you want to just build your own images using a bash script. Um, you can do that. You can use a Docker file. Uh, you can build images step by step yourself from the command line, you could certainly do that. But there are some other projects out there. Um, there's Podman, it, you know, Podman runs containers, um, Builda builds images, uh, Scopio transfers container images from remote repositories. And the cons though for these is it's still just not really convenient to run these on Mac or on Windows, which is a typical development environment. Um, Podman machine is an option that still requires a Linux VM to run. Now, if you're on Linux, these are absolutely good, you know, so resources for you uh, to try and use. You can definitely um, get into these and try building and running your, your images and containers using these other tools. There are um, other ways as well. There's Jib, that is, a, you know, a Google container tool. Um, that uh, optimizes images without the Docker daemon uh, versus, you know, building a single layer with the application jar. Um, there's a Jib Maven plugin, there's a Jib Gradle plugin, um, and then there are other tools like Bazel, which is a Google tool, and then Conico, 
another tool that you can use to build images in your uh, Kubernetes clusters. So lots of tools out there now. Uh, um, thank you for posting those links. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, the links about the low level and high level runtimes. Excellent. And uh, put a reference to Jib as well in case anyone is interested because I have come across Definitely. Jib. Definitely. Definitely, that's a good one. Um, take a look at Bazel and Conigo too. Those um, may be useful for some folks. All right, now that we understand uh, what Docker entails and some of what's going on in the market, let's just focus on the container itself and how that actually looks on your system. And you'll find similarities no matter what tool you use. Uh, I'll show you how a Docker container is stored and what is actually happening under the, under the covers. And you'll discover pretty quickly that images and containers aren't really all that magical <laughs> when you get into the details. Uh, my first experience with containers was as a new developer on a project. It had a tight deadline, which almost every, every project I've been on is always under a tight deadline. The best course of action for me always as a developer was just to jump in and get started, get something up and running on my local machine. So collect the code for the projects, um, get it up and running, make sure that I you know, get something reasonable as output. I learn best by doing, and the Docker documentation is actually really good. So um, the very first time I came across a Docker file, you know, that's the first place I went. So if you find yourself in a similar position, definitely go there. There's a really good getting started um, guide in, in um, the Docker documentation that gets you comfortable with all the commands you need uh, and stuff like that. First thing to note is that a Docker image is really just a tarball of a complete file system. When an image is unpacked, it's thrown into its own directory, which becomes its root file system. So that's how you get that isolation. The second thing to note is that the processes that are involved in running containers are just regular Linux processes. On top of that, there's just a few Linux features that are used together in a way to achieve the isolation that we want from containers. And uh, namespaces is an important ingredient. Uh, that is what is used to provide that virtual separation between containers. This is how the process inside a container doesn't interfere with the host or processes inside another container. And here you can see just an example of namespaces that were set up for a Postgres container that I ran on my box. Then there's C groups. The C groups functionality is essential for constraining how much a container can use things like CPU and memory and network bandwidth, bandwidth et cetera. And I can set these constraints by including options on the Docker run command when launching an image. And here you can see that I've constrained uh, this particular one, um, the memory usage limit in one of my containers. Let's gloss over some file system details where containers and images are actually stored on your file system. This is not not just helpful to know this in your local development environment, but keep in mind the same thing is going on in your production environment as well and understand exactly what's happening on the host machines. Um, first off, after you install Docker, Running the command docker info spits out a bunch of information about your installation, including the Docker root directory. Now, um, Docker desktop, if you are, are playing with that, there's a, a really good graphical user interface and they've made a lot of this very pretty, but I'm pretty old school. I really prefer uh, command line stuff as much as possible. It just feels more um, honest to me. <laughs> like I, I can tell exactly what's happening. Um, so anyway, this, this particular command, docker info, um, you can figure out the docker root directory. This is where you know, everything that you're going to care about regarding docker images and containers will be stored. So if you're on a Mac, which I am now, uh, your containers are actually running a tiny VM. So you're going to need to use some utility uh, to get in there and get to the docker root directory to look around. Now, I used to be able to use screen to do this. Um, I don't know if, you know, if you're not familiar with screen, definitely practice with it first. Um, if you, uh, it'll mess up your text display pretty good if you don't understand how to 
um, enter and exit that utility the right way. So um, if you notice weirdness, that's what's going on. You have to do the right thing. Um, but screen doesn't work anymore for me. And I went looking around and I found this command that um, it actually uses another image that's based on Debian and has NS Enter installed. And it allows you to um, go into um, the namespaces of the process that you're running. And um, then that way you can get into um, your Docker root directory. You can just CD right there into varlib Docker and check it out. On a Windows machine, it's a little bit differently. I, I put a path here for a possible location of where your um, containers could be stored on a Windows machine. I stole my son's Windows machine to do this, to figure out where exactly um, how things were happening on his machine. And uh, he quickly took it back from me <laughs> and wouldn't let me play with it anymore. So that's as much as I got for the Windows machine. This slide shows how <laughs> I love that comment. Kids also should not use Windows. Yeah, it is pretty dangerous. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, this slide actually shows how you can get information about these images that you have stored on your system. And first, I, I list my available images using the Docker images command. Um, I actually have several installed, but only the first couple on the list would be displayed here. Uh, using the Docker inspect command, I can um, I can inspect image any image I like using its image ID, and this spits out a ton of in interesting information. But what I want to highlight here is the graph driver section, which contains the paths to the directories where all of these layers that belong to this image live. Now, Docker images are composed of layers. You've probably heard that over and over again, but what does that actually mean? Um, a layer is, it correlates to uh, a instruction in a Docker file. So when you have a Docker file and you have all the commands listed, um, there's commands that they actually create a file system. And then each subsequent command will create um, another, like a diff of what's different. And um, each one of these layers translate into directories and these layers can be shared across images in order to save space. They're all identified by a SHA. Uh, the lower DIR, merge DIR and upper DIR sections are especially important. The lower DIR directory contains all of the directories or layers that were used to build the original image. And these are all read only. The upper DIR directory contains all of the content that has been modified while that container is running. If modifications are needed for a read-only layer in lower DIR, then that layer is copied into upper DIR where it can be written to. And this is called a copy on write operation. It's important to remember that uh, data in upper DIR is ephemeral data. It only lives as long as the container lives. In fact, if you have any data that you intend to keep, you need to utilize volume features of Docker or mount a location that will stick around and be persistent after the container dies. And this is how you know, most containers running a database are run. Uh, it's also important to, um, you know, if you have logs and stuff that you wanna keep, make sure that all of those are being collected and shipped you know, to, you know, Splunk or something where you can monitor them and make sure that you address everything in your application that produces logs because they'll just fill up your machine. Um, they'll fill up all of your, the space that you have allocated for that container. So make sure that you're um, not only just doing log shipping, but that you are uh, rotating logs as necessary and you're capturing everything that needs to, you know, come out of that container. The merged DIR is kind of like a virtual directory that combines everything from lower DIR and upper DIR. Uh, the way the union file system works is that uh, edited layers that were copied into upper DIR will overlay layers in the lower DIR. So if you exec inside a container and look around, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the merged DIR. This is important to note because um, 
I often see Docker files that have kind of like, like commands that try to correct the past, um, like maybe a command that deletes things or uh, you know moves things around. And because of the way that layers are built um, in a Docker image, that's not the best way to get rid of stuff. So let's say like you have a base image, but, and, you know, someone put a secret in there or something and you want to get rid of it. And, and I, you know, later on in the Docker file, I'll see like removal of that or, or even a removal of an old package and then an upgrade to a new package. And the problem with doing things that way is that that old information never really goes away. It just gets overlaid with new information. So the size of your image, you know, will continue to grow. It, it's better to, you know, clean everything up from the very beginning um, and not try to, you know, fix stuff in the middle. I've seen some pretty interesting things regarding that. Uh, we can talk about those later if you like. <laughs> okay, this um, slide shows, I actually have a few containers running. Um, Note the container IDs of these running containers match up with the container subdirectory names. And something to remember here is if you stop a running container, that corresponding directory does not go away until that container is actually removed with Docker remove command. So if you have stopped containers uh, lying around that never get cleaned up, you'll see your available space start to dwindle. I ran into that pretty quickly when I was first starting because I kept launching containers over and over again, not realizing, realizing that it's necessary to clean up after yourself and remove them. I didn't know that um, all of those directories were being added to my local machine, especially since that Docker root directory is kind of, uh, it's not the easiest thing to get to. There is a Docker system prune command you can run to clean things up every now and then. Or you can launch a container with a flag to indicate that it should be removed when it's finished running. Um, also, um, your orchestration, like Kubernetes, you can also indicate that your containers need to be destroyed when they stop running. So that you have those options as well. I have a question about work dir docker file command relates to work dir. No. Um, the work dir in a Docker file is basically when you exec into a container, it, it's a directory that you can go to that is inside your container. And then another comment, I hope there's a retention policy like auto delete after six months. That might be something you'd have to build because I don't think I don't think there's anything automatic built in like that. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, okay, let's move on to container gotchas. So all of the tool sets around building and running images and containers have made things so easy that it's also easy to shoot yourself in the foot in a few places. We talked about a couple of those already. I'm gonna go over some of the most common gotchas, including specific JVM gotchas that I ran into immediately when I started working with containers. The first is, seems pretty simple running a containerized application as the root user. And I'll be honest here, when I was initially getting containers up and running, I was just so excited about how well it was working and just getting it working to begin with, that it was a while before I actually took this seriously. And I used to be really embarrassed about admitting that, but when I pulled up the latest Sysdig report and started looking through some of the other statistics that are available in there, they note that 70% or 76% of their customer containers that they look at are running as root. That really surprised me that that's such a high percentage. Now that you know that processes that are running inside a container are just like any other process on the system, albeit a few constraints, it's scary now to run as root inside a container. And doing that opens up the possibility of a process escaping the intended confines of the container and gaining access to the host resource. You need to reduce the attack surface of your container by following that principle of least privilege. Um, although containers are designed not to affect other running containers, you can't take that for granted. If someone gains access to your container and immediately has root privileges without even trying, 
They can also wreak havoc on your host, which means every other service that is running on that machine. How do we mitigate that problem? The best thing to do is to create a new user in the Docker file. There's a user command. Um, you can do that when, the, when a um, image is built in order to run <clears throat> processes as that user. There is a way to specify a user when running the Docker run command, um, but that leaves open the possibility of forgetting to do that. It's nice if the image is just set up by default not to run as root so you don't forget. Also, pay attention to the official images that you pull from Docker Hub. Just because they have an official tag does not mean that they are 100% safe for you to just use as is. Uh, you need to look in there and figure out if they are running as root or if you need to build on top of them and add your own user to run them, you know, things like that. And if you remind me after this talk, if you want to know how to look at those official images that are available on Docker Hub and where the actual Docker files live, I could show you where that is. Um, but do remind me if you want to see that. Okay, even though Docker provides you with the ability to set resource limits on your container, it does not automatically do it for you. In fact, the default setting is free for all, the Wild West with no limits anywhere. So make sure that you understand the resource needs of your application. Um, just because you're using containers doesn't mean you get to be lazy and not pay attention to how your application is running and what resources it requires. Uh, the resource usage of your containers is something that you're going to want to monitor over time and adjust as needed as usage of your service changes. It's a good way to determine if something is going wrong, if a new deploy is going wrong, for example, or if load on your system has changed. Let's say you've had this huge promotion and now all of a sudden you have all of these users. Um, that's a good problem to have, but it might be an indication that you uh, need to make an architectural change maybe split up the application further so that you can scale it appropriately, that kind of thing. Never updating. This is a huge security issue, but it is so easy to get complacent and not pay attention to what is actually getting pulled in when you build images. Not only do you need to be aware of outdated versions that you specify in your own Docker file, but you need to pay attention to what's in the base image that it's coming from. Um, Images can be built you know, in a hierarchy. They can have a parent image. That parent image could also have a parent image. So you need to do that research and go back through and figure out exactly what's getting pulled in, uh, what versions um, of packages, things like that. All of that can come back to bite you if you ever have to rebuild that image for some reason. And um, also um, because of the caching, the way images are cached, uh, there are some packages that may never get updated unless you explicitly say, you know, I want a specific version of a package. Not updating those packages and libraries that are inside of your container can lead to embarrassing results, of course, especially when there are tools available now, so many now, <laughs> especially with all of the the stuff that's been happening recently. Um, there's lots of tools available now to alert you when security issues have been discovered with specific artifacts. Even ensuring that you're running you know, your containers with a non-privileged user has risk when there are known vulnerabilities that exist within your container or even on the kernel of the host. That's important too. Uh, from time to time, exploits are found that enable attackers to potentially escape a container even though you have those safeguards in place. So keep up with those security updates. I've been on teams where this has not been a priority. And I have been on teams that um, have been mining Bitcoin without knowing it. So um, primarily you end up in that situation because of the fear of breaking a product or service uh, that's already working. Totally empathize with that, I really do. But that is a symptom of a different problem. And trust me, it's much worse to leak private data or potentially be the start of some domino effect that can bring an entire system down. So it's so important for teams to have a regular, um, a regular evaluation of the packages and versions that are um, used in building your product and to reserve time for that because it does take time to upgrade sometimes.
Um, let's see, um, there's one question here. Are Docker images immutable? Um, yes and no. Uh, it depends. They're immutable. They're as immutable as like a jar file is, right? If you use the same jar file for your application. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question completely, but um, once you build an image, uh, it's it's good to, and, and I see this in build systems all the time where you go to different stages like uh, QA or you know production, and then the, the image is actually rebuilt at those stages. I don't think that's a good idea. You, and just like a, a jar file or a war file, you build it once, right? And then that exact file is what goes through the whole process and gets approval of QA, gets approval and in integration testing, um, smoke testing, and then finally gets released, right? And that should be the same process for images. You build them once and then move them through your software development lifecycle until it gets to production. All right, oh, uh, another question, is there a way to change Docker root dir? Absolutely. Um, I was in a situation where, you know, we're running out of memory because um, we had some pretty large services running and it was just because that directory, that um, var lib docker, um, that needed to be, you know, mounted to like an external drive with a lot more space. So that's something to look into. Uh, you can certainly do that. Um, there is a, like a configuration file where you can say to, um, you know, put that directory somewhere else. I just kept it the default, but mounted that directory onto another um, drive, which that worked for us pretty well. Uh, really though, if you find yourself running out of, of space, um, that generally means there is something running inside your containers that is producing artifacts that aren't ever getting cleaned up. And most of the time it's some set of logs error logs, something that um, builds up in there. So be mindful of that stuff and monitor that directory. Um, that's a good idea to do it and make sure that you have a monitor that lets you know when you've gotten to you know, a certain amount of, of free space available on that drive. All right, this gotcha is JVM specific, very specific to containerizing Java applications, which was the very first thing that I tried to do. And it's also very much related to being aware of what your application requires to run successfully regarding memory, which, you know, some Java developers get kind of lazy about because the JVM is pretty clever at automatically determining settings for your swap and your heap and your garbage collection behavior based on things like the memory and the number of cores available on the host. Well, remember earlier in our history lesson when I mentioned the dates that Java 7 and Java 8 came out? Java 7 was in July of 2011, on Java 8, March of 2014. And considering the timeline of Docker and Java releases, Java 7 and earlier versions of 8, certainly earlier versions, are not fully container aware. What this means is uh, those Java applications won't necessarily obey memory and CPU constraints that you put on your container, and you may end up with some surprise out of memory killer activity, which is exactly what happened to me. And it took me a while to figure out what was really going on. There were some improvements around container awareness that were introduced in a Java 8 update 131. And then there were further improvements in later versions, but to really get all of the benefits of container awareness, you really should get to at the very least Java 11. Um, obviously we're on Java 17 now, there's been a, a lot more um, you know, beneficial things that have been put in. So um, if, you're, if you're on 11, you might as well you know, get to uh, the next LTS release as it is. But making that jump from eight, that is the most difficult one. And I know so many teams right now that are still on Java 8 for very, you know, there are reasons that is the case. Um, it, it is a pretty big jump to get to nine and 10. Um, let's see, there are, you know, there's a really good article. I'm, I'm gonna bring it up here. Let me see if I can find it really quick and drop it in the chat. 
hopefully I can find it because it is a really, really good article um, done by Red Hat. And it was put out by Rafael Benavides. This is clear back in 2017, but it's really good information. So I'm gonna slap it in here in the chat for everyone. You can take a look and get some more details on um, you know, older versions of Java and getting that stuff wrapped up there. Right, moving on, let's talk about image bloat. Um, pulling in very large or uh, parent or base image images that include a bunch of stuff you don't need that increases your attack surface area from a security perspective. And also shipping those large images around and storing them can be pretty clumsy and slow. And we're paying for every bit of storage now. Um, this reminds me of paying, remember when we had to pay for each text you sent on your cell phone? I don't know if you remember that, I'm aging myself now, but that's what it feels like right now with storing you know, anything in the cloud anymore. So if you're storing these images, uh, they can get pretty expensive pretty fast if, if they're large images. Start using, there's a .docker ignore file that you can use when you build images. It works much the same way as like a get ignore file, and it helps prevent you from putting stuff into a production image that you didn't intend to. Um, I've seen Docker files where like the entire source tree of a project which includes tests and everything are just copied. Like there's one command in the Docker file that just copies the entire source tree into the image. And there's multiple problems doing that. Um, doing that in one line in the Docker file, that actually means one layer. So that means if anything changes, anything at all, that layer has to be regenerated every build. It's a good idea to uh, try to organize your code so that stuff that changes the most often is in its own layer. Um, might suggest you know, separating you know, implementations versus abstractions. Um, maybe put all of your class files, uh, copy those in one layer, but then maybe all of your third-party libraries and stuff that you've pulled in, that could be in a, a different layer, an earlier layer. Um, also, as far as copying stuff, um, including that uh, your .git directory, uh, that might be something that you aren't thinking of when you do this um, full-on copy of everything. You may be copying a .git directory into your, your production image. Um, not a good idea. You could be including secrets unintentionally. And like I said before, even if these are deleted in later commands, they still exist in those layers stored in the machine. So not a good idea to have those around. If you are pulling your Java source code into the Docker file with the intention of using Docker to go through and build your application, you're also likely including your build tool like Maven or Gradle. Um, you, you know, and that's not even just restricted to Docker. That's any language. You know, you could be, you know, NPM, um, any of those. So learn to use um, Docker's multi-stage Docker build. And I'll show an example of that in a moment so that you don't end up with all of those extra things in your production image. That brings me to distro list images. Um, distro list images are, are basically um, include the minimum amount, the minimum of what you need to run your application. Google has um, some distro list containers that they use. Um, and let me, I think I have a link here. They're usually, uh, they're usually, um, you know, based on a, a language. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, figure out what's actually in those distro list images, um, you know, curate them yourself. I think all of these that Google use, they're all based on Debian um, base images. But one other thing, um, they, you can't exec into them. There's no shell. Like I said, they only include what is absolutely necessary for the application. So unless your application itself needs shell for whatever reason, there's no shell, which means for a production image running, you know, you can't exec into it. 
And the first complaint that I get from those uh, is usually, well, how do we troubleshoot them then? And my first response is, well, why are you execing into a production image to troubleshoot anyway? <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good idea to me. As a developer, I don't want access to production machines anyway. So um, make sure that you, you know, all of your troubleshooting has been thought about beforehand if you choose to use distro list images. That means, you know, collecting logs, uh, whatever it takes. For distro list images, a good thing to do is um, basically print out the environment that it's running in and make sure that that gets shipped out to some log somewhere. So that's a really good uh, step to take in troubleshooting. Um, sometimes you can tell right away what's wrong just because an environment variable is set wrong or something like that. Uh, this is an example on this slide of a, of a multi-stage build. So you can see in this fir first section, we're using an OpenJDK image. Um, and then you know we're, we're creating a little, whoops, sorry, a little Java application. And then in the second section, we're actually using a distro list image using Java 11 here. They have 17 available as well. And in line eight, we do a copy. So basically the result of the first section in the Docker file is just copied into the second section. And that's all that's in there. That way you have the minimum um, requirements for your image and you get a smaller image that way. Now, just because you're using a distro list image, don't immediately assume that it's smaller and that it's safer. It's likely smaller, but make sure that you're pushing these images somewhere where you can see uh, if there's any security issues. Um, I have, I, and I think it was with this particular image, the Java 11 one, the, the distro list one, um, they may have updated it since I did this last, but um, I did have a situation where I pushed up the distro list image and then I pulled up the full blown open JDK image and it was actually the open JDK image that had a lower number of vulnerabilities. Now you could get into, you know, were, were they severe vulnerabilities or just, you know, things you don't care about. Um, I didn't go that deep into analysis, but I just found that interesting. For Java 17, I did that um, most recently. That was not the case. It was the reverse. Uh, definitely the distro list you were better off using. Um, also, you know, sometimes there are little libraries and stuff you don't realize you're missing until runtime, until it's too late. So definitely if you're using a distro list image, you're really gonna wanna, you know, put it through QA. Um, make sure that it's actually running how you expect. Don't just assume that everything's there that you need. Right, I think this is the last thing we'll discuss and just uh, managing your images. Note that when you have Docker files, um, especially all of the examples that you see online and stuff, they usually have a base image and usually the first line in this Docker file is gonna be something like from Ubuntu or you know from OpenJDK, like we just saw in the last example there. By default, all of those images are being pulled from Docker Hub. After a while, you might start running into um, pull limits. Uh, Docker Hub did, you know, they did start putting limitations on how often these images can be pulled um, anonymously anyway, um, before you actually have to get an account with them. And this happened a lot, uh, not so much with development machines, because think about it, when you pull an image on your development machine, <clears throat> it's cached. It sits there on, on your machine, just like, you know, like your, your uh, Maven repo, for example. Um, you know, that stuff sits there cached until you get rid of it. But in a build machine, when you're going through your whole CI, CD, it's possible that your build machine is always using a fresh instance, you know, so every single time that it builds, it could be potentially be pulling from Docker Hub every single time. So I would really highly recommend getting some kind of private registry. Um, JFrog has a free private registry that you can use. Um, and I have a link here. Um, we'll drop that. I'm going to drop that in the chat here. 
as a developer, this was really cool to use. I just signed up with an account and um, I was able, I'm able to push and pull images and take a look at them, see if there's security vulnerabilities in there um, and that kind of stuff, along with the analysis that I, you know, can do on my local machine as well. Um, very, very convenient to be able to do that. Now, also, um, the JFrog platform one, at least, it serves as a proxy to Docker Hub. So even if you, let's say you request Ubuntu, you can request it through your uh, JFrog platform instance. And it, if you don't already have it there, it'll reach out to Docker Hub for you and grab it, and then it'll cache it. And every subsequent request, even from another developer using that registry, it'll come from the um, platform instance instead of from Docker Hub every time. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, I had, you know, a couple other resources here. So I had that um, the start for free container registry resource. Um, but also, when you're building your images, and you, you know, are figuring out which version of Java to use and stuff like that, um, fuj.io is a really, really good place that uh, compares all of the different images, uh, you can find out a lot of information about um, whatever particular JDK that you want to use. You get more specifics on which one to use or which to update to, a, a great resource to help you compare those versions and get those details. All right, I think that is all. Do go and fill out that survey. Um, let me know your feedback. Go ahead and get your, your Apple Air, AirPod Pros. Um, that is a fun gift. And uh, we will select a winner from that raffle. We'll select it within three business days and then contact you by email. Um, and then once you formally accept it, then we'll share with the Meetup community who won. Thank you. All right. Any any questions? Um, I saw a lot of conversation within the Meetup community, so uh, I think a lot of it uh, is answered. Uh, but the, it's an open house for everyone. You can unmute yourself and probably ask questions in case uh, anything was missed in uh, the previous one. Um, there was a question from Sanjay. I did see some comments. I did see some comments on Spring Boot. Yeah, and, there was a, um, that was more like a, uh, what do you say, side, side discussion going yeah. around what you can do and can't without <laughs> yeah. Spring Boot. So I, I didn't, it was not, probably not a, a you know, fair uh, thing to pull into this one. And uh, I think I saw uh, the storage driver. Yeah, Sanjay is Sanjay's an active uh, uh, community member who is always willing to share his, uh, you know, ideas and knowledge with the community. Uh, there's a question from Sanjay that one can't we jump inside the Docker desktops uh, variables when I badly Docker directory from WSL? Uh, I think Sanjay, that's a probably a Windows specific thing. And Melissa, oh right, 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 right. Yeah, so Windows is becoming more attractive because you can run Linux, you know, natively, right? So uh, using the WSL and um, you know Docker desktop hooks into that, so you can definitely. Um, you know, there's no restrictions there. It's, you can use it for sure. And I think if you want to know more Sanjay, go and uh, read up uh, Scott Hanselman on his YouTube channel. Probably one of the best uh, tutorials on how to use WSL. Yeah, can you put that link on chat? Yeah. I'll try and give, give you a link uh, to his YouTube channel, okay. uh, Sanjay, Great. so that uh, you can, because I think if, if anybody's wants to know, you know, how to probably use Windows as a developer, uh, Scott Hanselman is one of the you know, leading lights to just go and listen I and mean, listen to him. Even if you're a brand noob coming out of college, he'll teach you how to set up your dev workspace. That's the amount of effort he's put in. So just go and check out his channel. It's really, I, mean, I, I as even after so many years, I find it uh, great just, you know, uh, listening to him. So I'm putting a link to one of the WSL videos for you, Sanjay, and we can probably explore more i've given it to everyone here you should have it i gave it the wsl2 video itself but i'll post a link to his uh, channel as well okay it's oh, anybody uh you know. one <clears throat> sorry this is alok so uh, melissa i have one i actually not question okay. but uh, sometime i got confused like uh, 
uh, between that the CMD command and entry point. So sometime we use the CMD command to uh, give the executable for the Docker file in the Docker file. And sometime we use that uh, the entry point. So uh, means- Oh, sometimes is, you use a command? Yeah. Yeah, Commander sometimes CMD. we use the CMD in the Docker file. Gotcha. To, yeah, okay. and sometimes we use the entry point. So what exactly basically internally differentiates? So I, I got confused in between them. So one of those you can actually override. Um, when you're launching a container, you can override the, the command in there. And then the other one is you know default what runs if you were to run that container without indicating which command to run. Does that make sense? So uh, what I mean, like uh, if I give the CMD in the Docker file mm -hmm. and while running the document container by using the Docker run command, so you mean like that time I can override that CMD command, whatever I have given. Exactly. In the exactly. If I give the entry point in the Docker file, I cannot override that. Right. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank I you. think uh, there are two uses. So one is you can define, you, you can fix your, your command with entry point and you might want to override the arguments. Okay. Uh, so you can use CMD to provide default arguments and when you're running you can override those that's another yeah i think for my yes. uh, side like it is basically uses for configuration properties whatever the configuration properties you want to provide so it cmd uses for that and entry is basically a specific tree level command that you want to run for that basically docker okay okay got it. yeah thank you so uh, one one question is um, and this is maybe more on the kubernetes side but i think most most of the projects are written in Go for Kubernetes and Docker. And are there any Java-based sort of libraries that are used? Or is it still just Go specific? It's still Go. Yeah, I mean, Docker um, itself is written in Go. Obviously, there's you know lots of other services out there that you know are running Java but uh, Docker itself is still written in Go. Uh, Melissa, like, is there any fundamental need like we need to prepare for that? Like before you taking these sessions, we should we read something? Like, uh, like do we really something to to understand like uh, the fundamental of like networking or like some operating system like Docker or something else? Do we need to uh, read about um, some fundamental would, knowledge? It would be helpful to have a good understanding of a Docker file in general like in the possible commands to use in a Docker file. Um, other than that, um, I don't think it's necessary to know anything else. I'll go over, you know, even, even for the Kubernetes part, you know, if we're using Conoco, um, I would just be using like a local cluster and explain how I have that set up. So it would be, it should be pretty easy to follow. Uh, Melissa, is this, uh, it's in-person conference, right, in Stockholm. So. Uh, yes. Any possibility of it being live streamed anywhere? I know that they're going to be recorded and they do share the talks okay. after. So even if you're not able to attend, uh, they will share the talks. I'm not sure about live streaming. I okay. don't know if they're going to have like a virtual part of the conference or not. Sure. Um, but that's definitely something I can find out. But I will call dibs on uh, the talk after you have done it at Stockholm. Then, okay, <laughs> we we'll call good. dibs on it. So if it if it happens okay. outside of Stockholm, it happens first in Bangalore. Check. Perfect. <laughs> I just have a very simplistic understanding. Can we say that containers are just processors running inside a, uh, a Linux host? It's it's yeah. somewhat contain somewhat uh, isolated, but it's essentially just another process. Yep, exactly. 